Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Reese Barrick and welcome to A New Way to Museum. I'm here at the Sternberg and I decided to come talk to you a little bit about some of my favorite types of fossils, which are really cool. Um, and those are trace fossils. What are trace fossils? Trace fossils are simply traces of animals and plants that lived long ago, but the animals or plants themselves weren't preserved in the fossil record, but just remnants or traces of what they were doing and how they were living are preserved. So a lot of you probably have some ideas of what trace fossils might be. It's probably the most common type of trace fossil that people think about on a regular basis are things like this. This is a footprint, right? So a track. This happens to be a track of a camel, which is kind of cool. Now, footprints and uh, traces like that can come in a couple of kinds. Sometimes when you step into the ground, you leave an impression. And that impression can come, become hardened into the rock and leave a footprint. So that's pretty cool. So now you have a trace of the animal. You got a trace of their foot, which helps you identify what type of animal it is. Lots of people today look at all kinds of footprints and tracks and trails of modern animals to figure out if there were raccoons or wolves or cats running around in the woods in the mud. But we can find these in the fossil record. And so sometimes they're imprints this way and sometimes the imprint will fill up and you will pop it out and you get this positive impression of a footprint. Footprints are cool because they give you an idea of the number of different types of animals that might be running around in a mud flat or a certain ecosystem which is pretty cool. They can also tell you a lot if you know what kind of animal made the footprint and how big it is. It can sort of tell you how tall it was and once you can do that you can actually measure how far away each footprint is from each other. So if you have a whole trackway of footprints you can figure out how far its stride was and if you know that you can figure out was that animal walking or running? So footprints are kind of useful for all sorts of things other than just cool it's a footprint of an animal. So one very common type of trace. What are the kinds of trace fossils are there? Well another common type of trace fossil are simply tracks and trails of invertebrates. So this is kind of a cool rock and you can see on here there's all these little long lines and looks like little tubes on top of the surface. Well that's what they are. They're tubes of worms and things that were burrowing through the sediment. And there's different shapes and sizes of tubes of invertebrates crawling through the mud, generally in the ocean. And they can tell us a whole lot about what life was like even though there's no actual body fossils. Um, tracks and trails could be burrows that are deep into the sediment which can tell us things like, were they uh, burrowing for food? Were they burrowing for hiding and protection so predators couldn't find them? Um, were they just moving around from place to place? And other things that are kind of cool about these sorts of trace fossils is they can tell you a whole lot about the environment. Um, you don't get really deep burrows unless you have lots of oxygen at the bottom of the ocean. So if you have only really shallow burrows, it might be a low oxygen environment. So you can also tell um, a lot of times how much energy there was. You know, were there lots of waves? Was there a lot of sediment being deposited? Some animals might make a burrow that's kind of vertical and they might leave little poops around the edges of their burrow to hold it together so they could burrow really deeply. Um, so that uh, they can essentially uh, go down to eat and have a place to live and not get, uh, they can be vertical so they can always get to the surface and not be buried by too much sand. So all kinds of cool traces by invertebrates and some of them are very uh, sort of indistinct but you just see changes in color in the rock and that just tells you that there are lots and lots of different organisms that are just turning up the sediment. Sometimes the sediment gets so turned up because there's so many organisms burrowing around that there's not much to see. So it's a kind of a cool thing to figure out 
maybe how deep you were in the water, how much sediment there was, how much oxygen there was, all you can figure out by just evidence of animals that were living in the sand. Other types of cool trace fossils. Well, one of them that is always fun, especially for the kids, are things like this. That's kind of a cool shape, and it looks like probably what you think it looks like. It's actually a coprolite. Coprolite's just fossil poop. Fossil poop's pretty interesting because you know you had something that was eating, and guess what? This is like the book we read when you were a little kid, Everybody Poops. Well, guess what? Everybody has always pooped. And so oftentimes, uh, coprolites don't get preserved because they're just poop that settles to the bottom of a river or a lake or out on the land, and they get broken down by bacteria and things. So they're not often preserved in the fossil record. But they come in several sorts of cool shapes, and very often they look pretty much like poop. Most coprolites uh, come from things that were carnivores. Because carnivores are eating things that have bone in them, they dissolve the phosphate, which helps to preserve the fossil poop. And occasionally, in fossil poop and coprolites, you'll find little bits of bone material. So you can actually figure out what the animal that uh, left the coprolite was actually eating, which is kind of cool. But not all coprolites come from carnivores. Some fossil poop comes from herbivores, or animals that ate plants. And they don't look like much because if you look, think about a cow or a horse, they plop out a patty. So they're much more indistinct, and they're also pretty rare to preserve in the fossil record. This one is a special one that came from some rhinos. And what's really cool about them, if you look in here, all this white bits, those are actually fossil grass seeds. So we actually have evidence of all the different grass seeds, and we can figure out what grasses this particular animal, in this case, a fossil rhino called T. leoceros, what it was actually eating. So there's a lot of evidence of diet that you can find when you have coprolites. Pretty darn cool. And because it's a rock, I don't really have to wash my hands right now, which is, you know, another benefit. Another thing that goes into an animal's gullet that we sometimes find in the fossil record, and that are these very smooth, rounded stones. What's interesting about these stones is they're basically chert nodules. And they're found, in, these guys are found, were found, out in the middle of carbonate rocks, chalks, where you would not find these perfectly rounded stones. They're not, there's no river nearby. So how did they get there? Well, these guys are called gastroliths. Gastro means stomach, lith means stone. So they're stomach stones. So certain marine animals, like in this case, plesiosaurs, would eat a bunch of these rocks, swallow them, and they would stay sort of in their gizzard, kind of like a chicken, and they would help grind up food, or in some cases, give them some ballast so that would help keep them down in the water column so they wouldn't automatically float to the surface. So when you find these outliers of very smooth, rounded stones, they're oftentimes gastroliths, which is really cool. All right, so other kinds of trace fossils are not just burrows and poop and footprint traces, but also borings. And they're anything but boring. Borings come in all kinds of sort of shapes. This is one of my favorites. And you see all of these little rounded areas. And you see some cool little areas here, which is what was actually wood. This was a piece of driftwood floating around in the ocean. And what happens is that this is from the Cretaceous, from the, our Western Interior Seaway. And whenever there's wood in the ocean, there's oftentimes shipworms. Right? There were no ships, but there's lots of driftwood and uh, ship, shipworms would bore into the wood, and each one of these is a boring that was filled up with sediment that represented an individual shipworm, which is a bivalve. And they would bore into the wood, 
and they would live there safe from anything that was trying to eat them and they'd be floating through the water so that they'd have a chance to uh, filter food out from the ocean. There's just barely a little bit of wood left. Sometimes you find absolutely no wood left, but you can, can tell by the shapes of these borings that it is a trace fossil called Pteridolites. Pterido is the name of the shipworm. So that's kind of a cool boring. Other cool borings come, give up other kinds of cool evidence of things that are going on. And so here's an evidence of predation. Predation means something's being eaten. This is a cool little uh, bivalve shell, clam shell. And you see there's a cute little hole in it. Well, that cute little hole was put there by this nasty little moon snail. This moon snail is called a natissid, and they're very carnivorous. And what these moon snails do is they have a foot that comes out from underneath them, like this, and they wrap around a nice little clam shell, and they use acid in their stomach to sort of etch out the shell, and then they have a thing called a radula that scrapes and scrapes and bores into a hole into the shell. And once they get the hole in the shell, they dump a whole bunch of stomach juices and acids, dissolve the poor little clam, and eat it. And what's cool about these snails is they eat all kinds of things. They've got clams that look like this, clams here, and they might also even eat other snails. So here's a nice snail shell with a perfect little hole of where it was eaten by the cool moon snail. And what's neat about this is you have a whole preservation of shells in a shell bed. You can get a ratio of how many animals were actually eaten by moon snails and which types of animals did they like to eat the best. Um, snails, clams, uh, different sorts of clams. You can also see that the moon snails would burrow in different parts or bore into different parts of the shell. Might be in the front part of the shell, might be in the far back part of the shell. And then there would become a race between the snails and the clams to figure out what kinds of defenses different species of clams would have in order to keep from being bored into so they wouldn't be predated on by these snails. So, or the snails would get to be really, really thick shells, which would make it harder for a, the poor snail to bore all the way through the, the shell before it, it maybe got eaten or it gave up or got bored and bored and tired. So, borings, very cool. Places to live, or a way to get food. So trace fossils, awesome fossils, can tell you all about the environment and the animals uh, that really weren't there, or that really were there, but they're not there anymore. So very cool, and thank you for joining us for A New Way to Museum. Thanks for joining us in A New Way to Museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. If you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.